Hello, and welcome to Parenting in the Age of the Coronavirus, a new podcast series from the Murdoch Children's Research Institute here in Melbourne. I'm Professor Sharon Goldfeld, and I'm from the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, or better known as the MCRI. This is the sixth in a series of podcasts talking about the relationship between what we're going through now in the pandemic and the coronavirus and its impact on children and adolescents. And in our first three of the series, we talked about parenting in terms of preschoolers, primary school kids and adolescents. And we've also talked about what it means for these kids to return to school, both in primary school and in high school. Today, very excitingly, we're going to talk much more about the coronavirus itself or COVID-19, or a whole range of actual names it's been called. One of the really exciting things for me, being at the MCRI, is I get to bring my friends to the podcast with me. And today, I'm really excited to bring two of those to talk to you about the coronavirus. Before I do, and before I give you that exciting details, I want to do two things. First of all, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we're located and to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to thank Medibank for their support in actually making these podcasts available. And at the end of the podcast, we'll tell you a little bit more about where you can get these podcasts and how you can have access to all six of the series. So today's podcast is called, How Does COVID-19 Impact Kids? And I'm joined by two amazing people. The first of those is Professor Dave Bergner, who's a paediatric infectious diseases clinician scientist. He's currently a National Health and Medical Research Council Senior Research Fellow, which is quite the mouthful, and a professorial fellow at Melbourne University, and is also a paediatric infectious disease consultant, which is essentially a paediatrician that focuses on infectious diseases at Monash Children's Hospital. I'm Sorry, also joined... interrupt. I'm not at Monash Children's Hospital, I'm at RCH. Okay. Uh, I'll say it again then. Thanks, Dave. I'll do the whole thing. So I'm currently jo I'm joined by Dave Bergner, who's a... Pro start again. I'm joined by Professor Dave Bergner, who's a paediatric infectious disease clinician scientist. That means he's a paediatrician that focuses on research and he also focuses on infectious diseases and he works at the Royal Children's Hospital. He's also a National Health and Medical Research Council Senior Research Fellow, which means that his research is really well acknowledged. I'm also joined by Dr. Kirsten Perrett, who's a group leader and also a clinician scientist fellow in the Population Allergy Research Group here at MCRI and at the Melbourne Children's Trial Centre. She's a paediatric allergist and vaccinologist, in other words, a paediatrician who focuses on allergy and vaccines at the Department of Allergy, Immunology and General Medicine, also at the Royal Children's Hospital. So no doubt, incredible people and welcome to you both. Sharon, I don't know if it's important, but I'm an associate professor. Just if you wanted to amend that. <laughs> We're not going to get beyond the introductions. <laughs> well, Fran, you're killing me. Okay. Um, I'll do the whole thing again. <laughs> we'll see if we get any further. I didn't know whether to interrupt you or not. It doesn't really matter, but it's just not correct anymore. No, no, we, we should make it correct. <laughs> we'll have a lot of fun editing this one. <clears throat> okay, let's try it again. And I'm also joined by Associate Professor Kirsten Perrett, who's a group leader and a clinician scientist fellow in the Population Allergy Research Group and the Melbourne Children's Trial Centre here at the MCRI. She's also a paediatric allergist and vaccinologist in the Department of Allergy, Immunology and General Medicine at the Royal Children's Hospital. And that means she's a paediatrician that focuses on allergy and vaccines. So welcome to you both. I'm excited to have you here. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks. Okay, so here's the first question. And it's a, it's a bit of a doozy, so I might actually talk to you both about this. 
So let's talk about COVID-19 in general. And we can talk about, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what COVID-19 even means as a virus. What does it do to our bodies? And what are the sort of symptoms we should look out for? And maybe, Kirsten, I'll throw to you in the first instance, and maybe you can tell us some of that background and a little bit about at least what we should think about in adults. Thanks, Sharon. Well, COVID-19 is an infectious disease and it's caused by a newly discovered coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2, which actually stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. It was first reported in December 2019 in Wuhan, China, um, and from there it spread worldwide. The virus itself is thought to have come from animals and bats uh, and possibly jumped uh, to another animal uh, as a vector before jumping then to humans. Possibly it originated from the wet markets in China, but there's still, we don't know, a lot we don't know. It is a very contagious virus. Uh, in fact, it can be stable in air droplets for many hours and can remain on surfaces for some days. There's still lots we don't know about the virus, but every day we're gathering information from all around the world uh, about how it behaves and how it presents in people. And in terms of what it does to our bodies, well, the symptoms of COVID-19 uh, are quite wide ranging. They can range from a very mild flu-like illness to quite severe pneumonia. And in some cases, it can be so mild, in fact, people don't even know that they have it. And that's known as asymptomatic infection. Some people therefore recover very quickly and very easily, and others may get sick very quickly and uh, are quite poorly. So the virus itself enters our body, usually uh, through the respiratory tract. Uh, the virus itself uh, enters the cells and can hijack inside the cell uh, the machinery that then multiplies many, many viruses that then spread throughout uh, the body uh, to other organ systems. And that's why the virus itself can affect our smell, our taste, our immune system, our breathing, our heart, our brain, and really leaves no part of our body unaffected. The symptoms uh, to look out for are things like fever, cough, sore throat, shortness of breath. But there can be other symptoms uh, which are quite nonspecific, like a runny nose, a headache or muscle or joint pain, tummy pain, diarrhea, nausea. And of course, just being very tired uh, or losing one's appetite. And the important message is really that if you feel unwell at all, please get tested and see your doctor. Thanks so much, Kirsten. That was a great summary. I wonder if I can, this is a bit of a question on notice, but I wonder if you could just share with us why this is different or not different to other viruses. So lots of parents out there kind of get the flu and they kind of get what the flu virus is and they kind of get what a cold virus is. I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about what the differences or similarities might be. Maybe Dave, this is something you might be able to answer. Um, we'll give Kirsten a break because we're gonna come back to her in a minute. Just so that parents can kind of work out why it's the same and why it's different. Yeah, of course, it's a very good question. I mean, this is a, this is a, a fascinating virus. In some respects, it's a, it's a respiratory virus that everyone will be familiar with because they or their children, uh, I'm sure, would have had colds and coughs and the flu uh, and similar infections. But on the other hand, it's a, it's a respiratory virus or a virus that hasn't read the textbook about how it should behave. So it's, not, it's doing some unusual things that are uh, scientifically very interesting, but also um, have implications for how we approach it, especially in children. So, for example, unlike influenza or... Uh, RSV, which is another common respiratory virus we see in preschool children particularly, this is a virus that really generally leaves kids untouched. So kids are, if they're infected, they seem to be infected at a rate less than adults. So when we go looking for the virus with those uh, nose and throat swabs and use very sensitive techniques, molecular techniques to look for the viral uh, RNA, we don't find it as often in children as we do in adults. And even when children are infected, they are often, as Kirsten said, uh, infected asymptomatically. They have no symptoms often or very few symptoms. That's really in contrast to um, what we see with other respiratory viruses. And then in adults, when the adults who are, are severely affected uh, and uh, have the, 
the worst outcomes uh, seem to be those who are older, but also those who have a number of other pre-existing medical conditions. And maybe we can come back to that a bit later, but the, the cardiovascular and metabolic conditions um, pre-existing seem to put those adults at particular risk. So Dave, just following up from that then, it sounds to me like in some ways this is a virus like all other viruses in that it tends to come from other people, it tends to be transmitted between people via coughing or sneezing on people. Um, do you think one of the things I guess for us to think about is, is it more infectious or less infectious than some of these other viruses? And maybe you can just say a little bit more on its effect on kids. I know you've talked about it briefly, but it's just, I guess, really interesting when we're talking about kids going back to school, and we'll talk about that in a moment, about its impact on kids. So just to answer the first question as best we can, and this is, as Kirsten said, this is a virus where every day you wake up to a, um, a barrage of new information about this virus, some of which, um, uh, turns out to be wrong. Some of it turns out to be true. So there's, we're constantly learning about this virus. In terms of its infectivity to others, initially it was thought to be highly infectious. Uh, so for example, if, if one person had the virus, they would then infect maybe three or four other people. Um, it's a little unclear whether that's strictly true. It certainly is very infectious, but there are certainly families and, and um, scenarios where it seems to be less infectious but also of course we've seen a number of uh, well-documented outbreaks in relation to return travelers or workplaces so it's clearly an infectious virus as you say it does seem to be spread both by aerosols or droplets uh, when people breathe cough or sneeze but also can survive uh, on surfaces for a number of days so potentially a very infectious virus which is why the public health uh, uh, the public health measures such as regularly washing your hands, social distancing, getting tested if you are at all unwell, even with very mild symptoms are absolutely crucial to try and reduce the spread of the virus. So taking all of that into consideration, what are we gonna do about kids going back to school? So Kirsten, I might ask you this, I know um, you've also got kids of your own and no doubt People have been asking you, what do I do? Do I send them back? Do I not go back? Are there certain kids that maybe shouldn't go back to school? For example, those who might have a um, compromised immune system, maybe they're on cancer treatment or have a chronic disease. Are there things that parents are asking you where you're going, oh, wow, I wonder what the answer to that question might be? Because I know they're asking me, so I figure they must be asking you as well. Yeah, well, thanks, Sharon. And yes, I've got four kids who have all finally returned to school uh, this week. And um, it is actually, you probably don't want me to say that because this will be much later down the track, won't it? <laughs> when it's aired. Oh, okay. Um, well, thanks, Sharon. That's a really um, good question. And I absolutely am being asked uh, that question by many of uh, my children's uh, parents. And uh, start again. Uh, <laughs> Start a lawsuit. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Sharon. That's a that's a great question, and I'm certainly being asked by um, other parents um, uh, at uh, the school. I've got four kids who have gone oh, back to school, and um, and it really is something that each family individual needs to talk uh, to their children about. Um, so there are some important steps that children uh, need to be. Uh, taking uh, and that is just washing their hands uh, often with soap and water, regularly using hand sanitizers, avoid touching their eyes and nose and mouth, uh, covering their uh, mouth when sneezing uh, with their sleeves and physical distancing where possible. But of course kids need to go back to school. It's really important for their education and learning and the risks are very, very small. It does seem that it's very, uh, uh, there's a very little disease around and kids seem to be getting uh, the disease uh, a lot uh, less uh, than their adult counterparts. For some children uh, who do have uh, a weakened immune system, um, and this might be uh, children, for example, who have cancer or who are on very a strong immunosuppressant or immune damping medication, um, 
they do need to be additionally careful, extra careful about uh, avoiding uh, being exposed to this virus. And they should talk to their doctors about uh, the risks individually to them um, and whether it's appropriate for them to return to school or whether there are appropriate measures that should be taken. But for most uh, children, they should uh, really, um, you know, and families feel very reassured that there are low numbers of kids being affected um, and uh, that if they do, they're very low um, and mild uh, symptoms. And Dave, did you want to add anything to that? No, uh, yes, I would. Um, I mean, I agree absolutely with what, what Kirsten's saying. I mean, one, but one of the interesting features of this virus, the COVID-19 virus, the SARS-CoV-2, um, that makes it a bit different from other respiratory viruses is that we don't seem to be getting a signal from those what we would normally consider at-risk groups. I mean, certainly they need to be careful and they need to seek medical advice. But so far, for example, children who are having treatment for cancer or children who are on uh, steroid medication or other uh, medications that suppress your immune system and would make you uh, perhaps more vulnerable to more severe influenza, for example, we don't see the same pattern so far in, in children who exposed to COVID-19. So um, that's an important difference. There are clearly different uh, responses from the body that are going to be important in controlling who gets this virus and who gets symptomatic um, when they are infected that may well differ from other common respiratory viruses that we've encountered previously. So Kirsten, help us understand why is this so? Why are children not getting sick? You know, there's lots of theories out there, one of which is, you know, because of all the vaccines, are they kind of souped up on vaccine and that kind of helps them? Is there something fundamentally different about children's bodies and the way they're developing their immune system that protects them? Or maybe something different about where they're developing their vessels and the way their blood clots, because we know that's one of the theories. So I know I'm throwing to you to sort of come up with the magical answer for which there isn't one, but maybe we can just explore a little bit, in your expert opinion at least, why you think um, these kids or any kids, and so as Dave just said, even the ones that you think should be getting sick are simply just not getting sick. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. That's a really great question and one that we're all working very hard to try and find the answer to. Um, there are lots of theories out there, and um, but it's fair to say that no one really knows exactly why children are not getting as sick as adults. Um, this is a completely new virus and there are still lots of unknowns. It certainly is possible that the kids' immune system um, interacts with the virus in a different way. Uh, to older older adults. And uh, some of the theories out there have proved true. They've actually found that uh, the particular receptor uh, that is in the lungs, which the virus uh, is, uh, um, the way the virus uh, attaches to the cells and comes in by the spike protein on, on, the, on the COVID uh, virus, it's actually expressed or there's less of this receptor in a children's lungs than there are in, in adults' lungs. And this might be one reason why the virus is less able to get into the cells and into the body in children. There's also uh, differences in the blood vessels in children. There's differences in the immune system um, and the immune cells. And uh, we do think that potentially because the children's immune system is more immature, uh, that this is uh, an innate or their immature immune response is actually protective um, against the virus. So yeah, lots and lots of different theories um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll know exactly uh, why and um, in time. So it sounds like if I sort of translate that a little bit more is that there's kind of less front doors for the virus to come in um, on kids to sort of um, get going in their systems, um, maybe compared to adults. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a good analogy. They're less front doors, and once it's in, it's certainly not as welcome. Um, it's kicked out, I think, much more effectively than it would be in adults. Yeah. One of the one of the ideas that w coronaviruses as a whole uh, uh, raft of different coronaviruses, and we've all had them. We all get colds with coronaviruses. It's one of the causes of the common cold. So one idea that's floating around is that, that we may have some what's called cross protection from the other coronaviruses. So when we get a normal common cold caused by a coronavirus, um, which may be more common, obviously, in kids, kids tend to get more colds and coughs and uh, 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 inf uh, mild infections than adults. Um, they may be, they may, their immune response or the antibodies they produce against that common non 
COVID coronavirus may provide some cross protection against this new infection. Although again, like most theories, that's unproven. Well, actually, Dave, I might follow up with that. I'm going to ask you a bit later on about what we might learn from kids, because I think there's probably some interesting learnings that might help us with adults. But I wanted to ask you specifically, because there's been some reports, particularly from overseas, on some children who have been sick with something that's called Kawasaki shock syndrome, which is a pretty technical word. And I know you'll help us understand exactly what it means. And some of these kids have tested positive for the coronavirus and some of them haven't. And so there's now this question going on about is this kind of strange Kawasaki disease related or unrelated to coronavirus? And I know that you're one of the world's experts on Kawasaki, so we're pretty lucky to have you on here today. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what your thoughts are. And actually, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about what Kawasaki's disease actually is. Sure. No, I'm happy to talk about Kawasaki disease till the cows come home. Um, we we, I we did, don't want to wait for the cows, Dave. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, um, yeah, I did feel like my two worlds collided, actually, when we had COVID-19 and then my lifelong interest in Kawasaki disease, um, which is one of the great mysterious diseases of, of um, pediatrics, both sort of collided in this, in this very interesting and, and potentially worrying way. But I think we should, we should preface this with... Uh, saying that we have not seen any cases of this Kawasaki-like um, uh, syndrome associated with COVID in Australia. So this is, um, it's been seen and there have probably been about, it's thought about a thousand cases in children worldwide. It's only been seen in countries that have been hit hard with very high levels of community transmission of the COVID-19. So it's something for parents and doctors to be aware of. But as I say, we have not seen a case in Australia, nor as it happens in New Zealand, both of which have low levels of community transmission. So just taking a step back, Kawasaki disease was first described in 1967 uh, by a Japanese pediatrician, uh, Tomisaku Kawasaki, who sadly um, died on Friday, actually, at the age of 95. He is one of the giants of pediatrics and and I and many of the people who work at MCRI and RCH have met him over the years. Um, a lovely, lovely man and a huge contribution to Kawasaki, uh, sorry, to mm -hmm. pediatrics through the description of this condition, Kawasaki disease, which I say is an enduring mystery of, of pediatrics. So Kawasaki disease is a disease that you see in young children. About two thirds of uh, the cases are in preschool children, a third in primary school age children. We see at least a case a day in Australia now. Um, and it's characterized by fever that can go on for several days and some clinical features that together uh, help us make the diagnosis. These include a, a rash, um, red uh, bloodshot eyes, red lips and red throat, um, redness and swelling of the hands and feet, which down the track can peel, the skin can peel and uh, a, an enlarged lymph node or lymph gland in the neck. So those are the, the features of Kawasaki disease, and Kawasaki disease was around for many, many decades before COVID even hit the scene. And Dave, but, just, to, just to, so our parents understand, the, the Kawasaki disease that we're seeing in Australia, even at the moment, is not related to the coronavirus. No, so, um, so that's one of the interesting features, is that um, Kawasaki disease rates, and we track Kawasaki disease, we have a number of surveillance programs in place already, looking at, uh, at the incidence of Kawasaki disease, they haven't changed. We've looked back over the first few months of this year during the pandemic, compared the incidence to the preceding few years, and there's been no change at all. So there's no uptick in Kawasaki disease overall. The reason we get it uh, it's cited about Kawasaki disease, the reason why it's important that in about one in four children who aren't treated, but in one in 20 children that we do treat, it can damage the coronary arteries. Those are the arteries that supply blood to the heart. It can cause dilation of the coronary arteries. And very occasionally that can be life-threatening. So that's Kawasaki disease. That's a, an old disease we know a lot about. We don't know what the cause is. We think it's uh, some sort of infection or more than one infection that's triggering a very abnormal response from the child's immune system, a very inflammatory response. Um, and that's what's damaging the blood vessels, especially the coronary artery blood vessels. So, so what, should parents in, in Australia be worried or the parents listen to this podcast, should they be worried about this for their kids? So uh, no is the bottom line. Um, the new syndrome that's been described in other countries, not in Australia, as I say, which is, is goes under various names. It's called 
uh, pediatric inflammatory multi-system syndrome temporarily associated with SARS-CoV-2, which is even more of a mouthful, and that's so shortened to PIMS-TS, and maybe we'll just call it PIMS-TS for the purposes here. Um, so this PIMS-TS syndrome is resembles Kawasaki disease, but the children are more unwell. Often they drop their blood pressure, they, have, um, they need to go to intensive care, and that seems to be associated with recent but not current um, COVID infection, again in countries where COVID is much, much more common than it is in Australia. And it's, and it's relatively unusual even in those countries. As I say, only a thousand cases worldwide about have been described, and we haven't seen any cases here. So I think the bottom line for parents is, and for doctors is we should be aware of this, but it shouldn't, A, we shouldn't be worried. We should keep these things in perspective. Personally, I don't think it makes uh, has any bearing on, on whether children go back to school or not. I strongly support children going back to school personally. Um, but also, um, it shouldn't detract from the fact that we should just be vigilant for when children are unwell, as we would before the pandemic. So if parents are worried about their children, they shouldn't hesitate to bring them to the doctor or, if necessary, to the hospital. We should just keep things in perspective uh, and carry on um, much as we did pre-pandemic days in terms of seeing when our children are unwell um, or um, you know, bringing them to the doctor as necessary. I think that's a really good um, message, Dave, because of course we don't want parents to worry about their kids potentially getting corona. We know that in other countries there's been less emergency presentations, for example, and what we want is parents to feel if their kid's unwell, please see a doctor, go to the emergency department, don't hesitate to do that unrelated to whether or not they might have coronavirus. Absolutely. Certainly on the wards, um, I know that we've seen some children who, where, where parents understandably may have been uh, a little bit later to present with their children. So the children can be more unwell by the time they come to hospital. So yeah, I'd absolutely reiterate that if your child is unwell, use your normal common sense and bring the child, bring your child to the doctor of the hospital as you would before. The hospitals have very good infection control in place. Um, very impressive and um, you know the risk of COVID from the hospital is really very very low um, and so would strongly encourage parents to bring their children to hospital as necessary. Great I think that's a really really good point. So if I might go from there to we've got a whole lot of unknowns really. Um, I always think of the you know frozen two into the unknown um, and we seem to be into the unknown. And so I wonder if both of you might share with us, um, I know I'm doing quite a bit of research at the Murdoch because one of the things we're interested in is how do we follow up these kids? How do we understand not only what's happening now? So there's three things, I think. What's happening now? What's happening as children go on into the future and the work that um, our group, and I know we're doing it together, with Kirsten as well, is, is interested in following up the kind of psychosocial impacts on children because, of course, many of those things are related to children not being at school for a period of time, the financial impact on families. So we know there's going to be this, what we've called this long tail of corona, but also the impact on their bodies um, and particularly adult bodies as well as the child psychosocial impacts. But I guess the other thing is to understand what's happening now, what's happening potentially into the future, but also what are the lessons? We've just been hearing this fascinating um, information about children really not getting sick, really not getting the virus. What could we learn from children that will tell us something about how we might treat adults? So I wonder if um, maybe both of you, I'll start with you, Kirsten, can tell us a little bit about some of the research that you're involved with or that you know of at the Murdoch. And we'll just do a bit of a quick flip through the Murdoch research book to have a look at what's going on. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. I think um, the Murdoch has really, you know, pivoted their research into COVID space and there are so many different projects um, trying to, to help um, understand uh, what this virus is and how it's behaving. Um, but I, I'd like to share with you, yeah, a couple of things that I'm, I'm involved with and uh, Dave and I actually 
uh, looking at this together. And we're really trying to um, harness the power of some of the uh, research that's already been done. So we're, we're taking our families who are research minded families who have been uh, terrifically uh, involved uh, with the Murdoch for a long time in these big what's called cohort studies, uh, which may have been looking at, uh, for instance, allergy uh, in the population. And now we're going to go to them and ask them if they would be happy for us to uh, uh, look at their children over this period um, of the COVID uh, period. And we really uh, want to understand why children are uh, responding uh, differently uh, to adults and uh, to begin to understand why there's this increasing gradient of severity and susceptibility from, from children as they uh, age uh, right up into adults. And so we're going to be looking deep down at the immune system. We've got bloods already on most of these children from before the pandemic. And then we're going to be looking at them, both the impacts like socially um, and, and on, on schools and learning and the impact on families and also what's happening at the cellular level um, inside their immune systems. And interestingly, many of these children may not exhibit uh, infection. Uh, as we mentioned, they may be asymptomatic, but they may end up having uh, some long-term uh, issues associated with acquiring that infection, even though they didn't exhibit the symptoms. So we'll be looking very closely um, at children across the ages. Another uh, project that I've been involved with um, is very exciting. It's looking at prevention of COVID uh, through the use of a, a vaccine. And this is called the BRACE trial. And many of you may have already heard a lot on the media um, and Professor Nigel Curtis is leading the BRACE trial, which is uh, really trying to uh, repurpose a very old vaccine, the BCG vaccine, which has been used for 100 years for prevention of tuberculosis um, and trying to use the off-target or the non-specific effects of this vaccine uh, to enhance the immune system over this period. So it's asking, it's trying to train the immune system by giving healthcare workers, uh, by randomising them, giving half of them a BCG and half of them not, and to see whether this might uh, protect those healthcare workers, uh, both from infection and uh, potentially severe infection. And that study um, is enrolling 10,000 participants with uh, the Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, funding this and uh, WHO uh, endorsing this trial. And that's not just in many sites within Australia, uh, but also uh, in Europe and in uh, South America. And that is uh, very exciting to be part of. So there's a couple and I'll oh, throw it to David too. Kirsten, can I just ask you about the boost, um, the boosting sort of power, I guess, of the BCG vaccine, just to help parents mm. get their head around it. Do you think that's kind of like the same theory that we've got with kids, that they have this kind of boost to their immune system and that's what we're doing with adults, giving them this boost to their immune system, a kind of, as you say, a kind of non-specific boxer that can fight whatever kind of comes their way rather than something that's really specific for COVID. Yeah, well, I, I don't think we can stretch the analogy quite that far, uh, Sharon, but the BCG is, is a live vaccine. So this is different to many of the vaccines that are given in childhood, apart from uh, things like the measles, mumps, rubella and the chickenpox vaccine. Those are also live vaccines. But we know the BCG is particularly good at stimulating a non-specific immune response. So it's not targeted just to make an immune response against a particular bug, but it creates a general immune system response. And this is why it's been harmed. Uh, in the BRACE trial. Uh, but certainly there are countries around the world where BCG is given to, to infants and potentially that may protect some of the infants in the poorer countries where BCG is given routinely. Uh, but BCG is not given routinely in Australia and we can't be sure that it does have any uh, protective effect and that's why we're doing this study. And it's, it's really kind of fascinating for, the, um, for our listeners for two reasons. First of all, um, that it's so large and it's been done so robustly. So we'll be able to know, like, does BCG actually prevent you either getting the illness or less severe? So that's very exciting. But the second thing is, um, which I know Kirsten touched on, is that it's not that hard to give BCG to everyone if it was successful. So... Those of you who are listening will know that sometimes it's hard to make a new vaccine and then make enough of it. So something that's already off the shelf, as you might call it, is very, very exciting. So thank you for that, Kirsten. So Dave, I might switch to you and maybe you can share a couple of projects with our listeners as well. Sure. Well, I, as a, on a personal note, I hope the Brace trial is successful because I'm a willing participant. Um, Me too. I've got this thing on my arm. <laughs> 
So I think that's very exciting and it will tell us a lot about the immune system and the immune system generally as well as, you know, specifically uh, with respect to COVID. Um, our research, as, as Kirsten mentioned, was, is, is looking both at who gets um, COVID-19 and if they get it, how severely they are affected, especially looking at differences between children and adults. And part of the study that uh, Kirsten mentioned, which uses these amazing cohorts that are uh, run through uh, MCRI, often with other partners. They are amazing longitudinal cohorts where we already have a huge amount of information about children's immune systems, and we're actually able to compare some of those findings with the adults from an arm of the BRACE trial. So it's very nice the way that people are working together on COVID research. Um, but we're also interested in whether there are any long-term effects of infection, um, even in children and adolescents who are, might be asymptomatically or very mildly infected. Uh, earlier on, I mentioned that uh, the COVID-19 virus hadn't really read the textbook about how it should behave in terms of respiratory virus. And part of that is the fact that a lot of the um, damage that it does in older adults seems to occur in blood vessels rather than in the lungs and the, the air spaces. And that's quite unusual. So one of the things I've been interested in and our group's been interested in for a while is the role of early life infection generally in increasing inflammation and then increasing possibly cardiovascular risk or risk of type 2 diabetes or risk of obesity. So that's a part of an ongoing large research project. And so Kirsten and I together are, are leading a, a, a study where we're inviting a thousand adolescents uh, from one of the allergy trials, uh, the school nuts uh, study, the school nuts cohort. And we're going to invite these adolescents in. We'll look at their immune system through a blood test. We'll also look uh, through ultrasound and blood pressure, et cetera, at their cardiovascular status. Uh, very, that all just takes an hour. And then we'll track them with weekly um, symptom app. So they just need to answer on their phone as to whether they've had any symptoms, whether they've had a test for COVID-19, and bring them back about a year later, comparing those who may or may not have been infected, and we can tell that either through the, the nose swabs that they might have had or through whether they actually just got antibodies against COVID-19. They may not have had any symptoms. They may have been infected asymptomatically. And then compare those who were infected and those who weren't and look at whether there are any long-term effects both on how their immune system functions generally, but also on their cardiovascular risk. And, and MCRI is brilliantly placed to do those kind of big studies like that. We have a lot of uh, skin in the game, if you like, on those kind of studies. So very exciting research. And it's probably worth saying, just in case any of those people and parents who are in our cohort studies, that we all, all of us, thank you for being part of those uh, studies. It's an amazing thing to have uh, families and young people part of these um, studies where we follow people up over time. Some of our studies have gone on for three generations. And so... That's a huge commitment by families out there and we're very grateful. And it is a, a kind of neat segue, I think, to my next question, which is really about the importance of research in this area. And in particular, I guess, we may or may not have a vaccine in the next kind of 12 to 18 months. So kind of what do you think uh, needs to happen next in terms of us, you know, getting back to some sort of new normal? What, what does that really mean for us? Maybe, um, Kirsten, if you want to go first. I'm glad it's Kirsten. That's a tricky <laughs> question. <laughs> I don't even know what you're getting at, Sharon. Um, <laughs> I can talk about vaccines. <laughs> that sounds like a great idea, Kirsten. Why don't you talk about <laughs> vaccines? Uh, yeah, thanks, Sharon. That's a very tricky question. You know, we are in a uh, uncharted waters here in terms of what the next phase looks like. And um, we really, really hope that um, through the uh, public health measures that have been put in place, that we will continue to see less and less cases, uh, like in some states uh, already in Australia, where they're having no new cases for a period of time. And uh, look, it would be lovely to think that Australia could uh, eradicate uh, COVID-19. Um, but look, Moving forward, we're going to have a very different uh, world here and Australia will contain uh, uh, COVID by border control. So we need to look at what Australia is going to look like and how we move out of that situation in the future. And I think vaccines really uh, are the key here and the answer. And uh, vaccine development is, is going at 
absolutely breakneck speed. Uh, it is absolutely phenomenal how uh, people are collaborating uh, and, and partnering around the world uh, in all aspects of vaccine development. So to make a vaccine normally takes uh, usually 10 to 15 years. Uh, and uh, we're trying to do this uh, in 12 to 18 months. So to get that sort of um, uh, ability, uh, numerous uh, strategies have to be at play. And so around the world right now, there's over 120 candidates, vaccine candidates in developing uh, in development. Uh, there are already 10 of these in human trials. Uh, and some of these uh, Vaccines are developed uh, on the basis of uh, previous vaccines or other viral vaccines, uh, such as an Ebola vaccine or a MERS, uh, another type of coronavirus vaccine. And some of these vaccines are using new technologies, some we've never used before, and, uh, and others are just using a conventional approach that we give to children every day. So there's lots of different strategies out there. There's uh, still a long way to go, um, but it's a very, very exciting space. And I think we also need to remember that not only do we need a vaccine, we need it to be immunogenic, which means it works uh, and it's effective, but it also lasts uh, some time. So we need to have sustained immunity uh, for a number of months to years. We don't want to be having to revaccinate uh, children and adults and people uh, too often, because of course that's more expensive. And we also need to manufacture this vaccine at incredible scale. I mean, we're talking about a vaccine here that needs to be given to everybody in the world, billions of doses. And so we don't only having vaccine development going on, but we've got uh, manufacturing processes to work out. Have we got enough vials? Can we actually put the product into vials and, and get it to the places that need it? Uh, and that is uh, absolutely phenomenal what's going on. So Dave, if we don't get a vaccine, or even in the next 12 to 18 months while they're developing one, what can we say to parents in terms of their kids and themselves? What does the next 12 to 18 months mean for them? What are the sorts of things they could or should be doing for the next, I don't know, I guess, 12 to 18 months while we live here in Australia? I think, I think it's clear that this pandemic has been a little bit unpredictable and, and um, the predictions that people make are not always correct. So I'm a little bit wary of answering that question, but I do appreciate it's my turn, so I have no choice. Um, I think I think the important thing is that, that Australia values science and scientists and clinically based research, and the government is taking advice from, from experts, and we have really good experts nationally and internationally. So I think the, you know, the, the government advice is continually being updated and reflecting current knowledge. So... I think it's really important that the basic measures that are in place around infection control, about, we say it again, hand washing, hand hygiene, where possible social distancing, those are all really important in keeping the infection under control and hopefully moving towards elimination. I think the advice about returning to school and returning to other activities is based on current best knowledge, best expert knowledge, and that should be followed. Um, and it's, um, uh, a lot of this is is you know will be updated i think that so that's i think it's important that parents follow current knowledge i don't think we should get complacent i don't think we've seen the last of this virus we've been luckily as a country spared largely not completely but spared in terms of the medical impact of this virus we certainly have uh, felt it and continue to feel it in terms of social economic uh, impacts um, but I, it's hard to predict we would hope that you know things continue to improve, that transmission remains low and goes down. Children go back to school. I think that's socially and uh, is incredibly important. Um, I'm thankful that my children are old enough that I don't have to homeschool them, but uh, I really um, take my hat off to those that have, because that's a tough gig um, for sure. And, um, and hopefully life will continue to return to normal. What we, it will look like in 12 months time, I think is really hard to predict. I think that's a really um, appropriate answer, I guess, Dave, because I do think there's so much of the unknown. But I think for parents, what you're really telling us, and I think they're really grateful to both of you, is that they should be reassured that um, essentially the um, COVID virus really doesn't seem to be impacting on children, that they should feel confident about sending their kids back to uh, school and obviously still back to early childhood education and care where they've been all along um, and that we will see some return of life to some sort of normal but 
that at least for parents, and I think this is a, a really important point for parents, that they should really be reassured that their kids will be okay, at least in terms of the virus itself, and that they're really simple things for them to do, like getting hand washing as part of their routine with their kids, teaching their kids to sneeze and cough into their elbow, um, having tissues that they can throw away, all of those kind of basic things that I guess parents always thought about all along, but have really come to the fore um, in terms of having soap, et cetera, around the house. I think those are the things that are really important for parents. So thank you so much for joining me today and sharing um, your amazing information and um, expertise with our parents and really giving them both a lot of insight into understanding this virus that hasn't read the textbook quite rudely um, and also just understanding a little bit about what's going on in the world as everybody's scrambling to try and make a difference both in the prevention of it um, but also in understanding it. So let me just say to everyone listening, if you've got any further tips or tricks you'd like to share or a question for our guests, please let us know. You can email us at podcasts at mcri.edu.au. And of course, if you'd like any further information about the issues we've talked today, you could do two things. You could visit our own website, the MCRI website, which has lots of information. But in particular, you could visit the Raising Children uh, website, which is lots of information designed for parents. And that's raisingchildren.net.au. And you'll be able to see in the show notes that we've included a link. Of course, if you've found this episode helpful and think your friends and or family may benefit, please share it with them and leave us a rating. Don't hesitate to reach out and seek the support you need. It is a difficult time for all of us. There are lots of helpful contacts that are available, such as Raising Children, but also Beyond Blue or Headspace, Origin and Kids Helpline. And these are all available for additional support if you need it. Once again, I'd like to thank Medibank for making these podcasts available and to thank our wonderful guests, Dave and Kirsten.